Hi, uh, my name is Sanjay Mukhopadhyay. I'm a thoracic pathologist at the Cleveland Clinic and today I'm going to share an interesting case with you that illustrates a couple of important general principles in the determination of primary lung carcinoma versus metastatic carcinoma to the lung from other sites. So the patient um, in this case uh, was an elderly woman with multiple lung nodules at presentation and she was a smoker and obviously clinicians take this into consideration when they're making a decision for, um, as to whether there's primary lung cancer or a met from another site. Now in this particular case, um, the patient had a history of endometrial cancer, endometrial adenocarcinoma uh, to be precise, eight years before the current pres uh, presentation. So at that time, eight years prior, the patient had a FIGO grade one uh, endometrial adenocarcinoma with 90% myometrial invasion, but a pelvic lymph node dissection was done and the lymph nodes were negative. She had uh, radiation, so surgery plus radiation at the time, uh, but no other treatment. And then uh, she was well for the next eight years. She actually had a chest x-ray three years after her hysterectomy and that was negative. So, you know, eight years out from um, an endometrial cancer, FICO grade one, and then with lung nodules. And at that point, uh, which is the current time, she underwent a lung biopsy. And here's the picture from the lung biopsy and you can see glands within this uh, malignant tumor. So it's, there's clearly an adenocarcinoma component. I'm showing you here one of the glands that's in the biopsy. And here's another one. And so clearly there's an adenocarcinoma component and it's malignant. But in addition to that, there's what appears to be possibly a squamous component here. It's a little bit more solid appearing and then a little bit more solid there. So at the time, and this is way back in the pre, uh, um, you know, um, in the 90s, so in, in the era before Pax8, was available. At that time, uh, this was called adenosquamous carcinoma. And one can see from this picture why that would be an appropriate diagnosis. So the pathologic diagnosis was adenosquamous carcinoma and the clinical diagnosis, uh, the clinician thought that this was a probable lung primary. Um, possibly there was a, you know, dominant mass and the others were slightly smaller. The patient was a smoker. The endometrial cancer was a long time back. So they had a discussion with the patient and the patient refused treatment. Uh, she said that she, you know, given the toxicity of therapy, she didn't want to um, um, undergo toxic chemotherapy. Now the interesting part of the story starts now. What happened after this was the patient went for eight years with this presumably, um, you know, advanced lung cancer, went eight years without therapy and doing relatively well. And at eight years after that, um, uh, a clinician, another clinician saw her and decided to biopsy the nodules again. So I'm going to show you that now, eight years after the um, lung biopsy of the nodules. So at that time, uh, one of the pathologists thought to do an estrogen receptor study and estrogen receptors were of course positive. This was actually still in the pre pax 8 era, but we went back now and stained that tumor in retrospect uh, with pax 8 and you'll see that PAX-8 is strongly and diffusely positive. Again, I'll, I'll mention that again, PAX-8 is strongly and diffusely positive in the neoplastic cells. And as you know, strong PAX-8 positivity means that this tumor is likely either a GYN primary or a renal primary or a thyroid primary among some others. But really now it argues against this being primary lung cancer. So this is strong and diffuse PAX-8 positivity and of course PAX-8 is a nuclear stain, so cytoplasmic positivity should be disregarded and you should be only looking at nuclear positivity. And of course, here's a TTF1 stain because you're thinking of a lung cancer as the differential diagnosis and TTF1 is completely negative. So it's clear at this point, given the history of endometrial cancer and this thing staining with Pax8 and estrogen receptors that this is not lung cancer, this is actually a metastasis from the endometrial adenocarcinoma. Now, if you look back at the primary tumor, the tumor in the end endometrium, that's what it looks like. It's very similar to the tumor in the lung. In fact, it makes glands very similar to the tumor in the lung and has these solid, you know, squamoid looking areas that are very similar. So this is a metastasis, a late metastasis to the lung eight years after the original um, uh, um, hysterectomy. And then there was a, another biopsy of the same lesion eight years after that. And interestingly, this patient had a, um, a very interesting uh, course. We'll go back to this slide. Very interesting course in that she lived a long time after even the second lung metastasis. So overall, she lived um, about 
13 or 14 years out from the uh, first lung metastasis and I believe uh, that it would be about 22 years out from the um, original uterine cancer diagnosis. So very significant change in diagnosis. If you think of lung cancer, most patients live only for a, a couple of months or, or the first couple of years after um, metastatic lung cancer. It's a very, very poor prognosis tumor. So this is a very significant diagnosis to make the, dif the differential between primary lung cancer and a metastasis from the uterus. So if you have a case of immunohistochemically proven metastatic carcinoma in the lung, just like this case, but the primary non-lung carcinoma, like endometrial in this case, was diagnosed several years ago, and you're, you're, un, you know, you're uncomfortable with that idea that could the patient have been so-called cured so long ago and now has a metastasis from that tumor, you need a reference. I will show you a reference in the next slide that documents that late metastases to the lung can occur after very long disease-free intervals. In other words, you could have a renal cell carcinoma or a uterine carcinoma. You could be disease-free for five years, 10 years, 15 years, and then develop a metastasis to the lung. That can happen. Uh, this paper also provides details of the clinical implications. Now, interestingly, these things um, are very indolent, which is not surprising. And this paper also has long-term follow-up data on cases like this from a variety of uh, sites other than the lung. So please read this paper and file it for future reference. Here's the uh, reference of the paper. It, it was um, uh, published recently in the Journal of Bronchology uh, and Interventional Pulmonology. And this has several cases of this type in which the uh, interval between the original non-lung primary and the metastasis to the lung is greater than five years. And in some cases, very, very long. Um, I would mention that endometrial cancer is one of the classic primary sites that does this that can have a very long disease-free interval and the other one is renal cell carcinoma where the interval between primary tumor and MET can be very long. Now one might ask from this, well how reliable is Pax8 staining? Can you ha ever have Pax8 staining in lung cancer? And that's I think a reasonable question when we're saying that you should be so um, dependent on the immunohistochemistry. Is the immunohistochemistry that reliable? So I would like to uh, draw your attention to another paper and this was written by one of our residents here, Kelsey McHugh, and this was presented as a platform presentation at the United States and Canadian Academy of Pathology USCAP uh, annual meeting and is now published uh, in um, Applied Immunohistochemistry and Morph Molecular Morphology. It's in press. And in this study what Kelsey did is looked at 418 uh, lung cancers, primary lung cancers of all kinds, adenocarcinoma, squamous, large cell neuroendocrine, small cell and so forth, looked at all those cases and stained all of them with Pax8 to see, to answer the question, can you ever get strong and diffuse Pax8 staining, just like the one I showed you just now, can you ever get that in lung cancer? And the answer simply is no. You cannot get strong and diffuse lung, uh, Pax8 staining in any kind of primary lung cancer. Now you can get patchy focal staining in large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas and that was shown in this paper and others have um, uh, reported patchy focal staining in other cancers but from our review of the literature which you can also see from this paper there's not a single case in the world literature so far where strong and diffuse nuclear staining for Pax8 has been shown in a uh, confirmed primary lung cancer. So this is a very useful piece of information that's very helpful when you're trying to decide is this a metastasis from a uh, GYN or renal tumor or is this a primary lung adenocarcinoma? So that's something I'd like to leave you with is the importance of Pax8 in this uh, setting and thank you for your attention.